All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special <coughs> guest, a re- returning guest. His name is Recluse. He's just published a book, an excellent book, which I've read. The title of the book is Strange Tales of the Parapolitical. It's published this month, 2020, April 2020. He has a blog spot with tons of information, just like the book. That blog is viceupview.blogspot.com. It's V-I-S-U-P-V-I-E-U.blogspot.com. And we did a, an interview almost a year to the date last year, and we covered some of the material in the book. We talked a lot about the fascist networks in Europe, Le Cirque, etc. But uh, we're going to cover this book. A lot of interesting information that tied in with a lot of stuff I've researched about Leary and some of these other characters. But uh, he's going to go in detail or talk more in detail about that. So, Recluse, are you there? Yes, I am. Awesome. Well, thanks for agreeing to the interview. For people who don't know of your background, can you talk a little bit about how you got interested into in parapolitical research, a t- little bit about your blog spot, and uh, how this book kind of came together? Well, um, you know, I really picked up, I'd say, a lot of this stuff from my dad. I mean, certainly he was uh, a bit of a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I can remember listening to, like, Bill Cooper with him on the radio back in, like, 92 or 93, I think. I, gosh, I would have probably only been about 10 or 11 years old then. Um, so I sort of grew up a bit in this culture, but I didn't really become especially interested in, you know, really legitimate parapolitical research until around the time I started my blog in uh, 2010 or thereabouts. So, yeah, it's been a about a decade now in the game, so to speak. Um, as for the book, it was pitched to me by uh, my partner on my podcast, Frank Zero. Um, it was actually in the middle of my uh, honeymoon, ironically, in Washington, D.C., uh, in between going to the uh, Scottish Rite Masonic Temple and the International Spy Museum. I got an email from him. Uh, basically, he wanted to do something sort of based on some of the blogs that I had published that had dealt with uh, Naomi Klein's concept of the shock doctrine. Um, but I've never really been a big fan of just, you know, repin. Uh, reprinting blogs and that type of thing so I wanted to do some original essays with new content and they kind of revisited some topics that I had explored on the blog so that was um, you know, essentially the genesis of what became the strange tales of the parapolitical um, you know, it was definitely quite an interesting journey for uh, my first experience publishing <laughs> <laughs> it can be uh, usually there's a lot of ins and outs uh, in my memory did you, yeah. you self-publish this right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went through Amazon and all that uh, jazz. Uh, probably going to try to find a different publisher, uh, you know, to print the books next time around, so I don't have to split any royalties with Amazon either. Well, you know, the, the, that, from my experience, those royalties are the best if you self-publish. So, but you yeah. have to do a lot more footwork and figure a lot more things out. But uh, what's the name of your podcast, by the way? It is uh, The Farm. Uh, You can find it at www.thefarmpodcast.com. It's all one word, no hyphens or anything like that. Gotcha. And you kind of cover the same subjects that's in this book and your blog, is that correct? Uh, mostly, I mean, it's, you know, definitely there's a lot of parapolitical stuff, but I mean, my partner Frank Zero is more into synchronous mysticism and what have you. I mean, we've had Chris Knowles on quite a few times, so it's it's probably a little more pop culture oriented than some of my writing and vise up in the book is. Gotcha. And uh, so you kind of came across this strange ter- uh, tales of the parapolitical. Maybe we can just get started to kind of discussing the themes in your intro of secret societies. Trauma was a con- recurrent theme through the book. And maybe you can talk about that and uh, get into kind of the information in the early chapter. Well, that was uh, it was actually Frank who wrote the early chapter. Um, yeah, he was the one who did the early chapter in the RFID chip at the bit, uh, bit at the end. But um, yeah, that was sort of Frank's kind of overarching theme when he had originally pitched the idea of the book to me. Is we wanted to, you know, basically focus on how trauma affects society as a whole. Um, of course, when you get into a lot of this type of research. It usually is more oriented towards the personal level, of course, with a lot of the, um, you know, the quote unquote behavior modification experiments and that type of thing. But um, it's certainly a really interesting question of how these kind of techniques were applied on a mass scale. And, um, you know, that was why Colonia Dignidad and Chile were, you know, kind of an obvious uh, topic to cover initially. Um, of course, in Noam McClyme's premise of the shock doctrine, Chile was really the first nation where um, a fully formed version of it was rolled out so to speak um and then you know kind of from there getting into some of the stuff with the Mellon family and then finally um 
the private contractor essay, which uh, was the one that took me the longest to think of, uh, but uh, I think that was, uh, in a lot of ways, my favorite in the whole thing. Gotcha. Sorry to interrupt, but is, is there music playing in the background? Oh, yeah. Do you need Can to you turn that it? off? Yeah. Can you turn that sure. off, please? Awesome. Thank you very much. For people who don't know, trauma is one of the recurring themes in the book, but also you reference Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine frequently. For people who don't know why that book is so important, can you explain her and what's in that book? Well, essentially her premise uh, was to try to combine, uh, on the one hand, the techniques that had been developed by MK MKUltra, uh, specifically Ewan Cameron's you know, whole process of psychic driving and that type of thing, and show how that it had been applied um, to Chicago-style economics uh, of Milton Friedman, and in general how you know this kind of concept of a shock, um, and of course in the MK Ultra circumstances it would have been with a you know literal electroshock to the brain. In the case of on a national level, it would be some kind of natural disaster, or a coup, or something to that effect. And then essentially how Chicago-style economics tried to reorient civilizations in much the same way that the the MK Ultra programmers tried to do on a personal level. I mean, certainly it was a very novel concept when she first kind of unrolled this, uh, I think it was a little over a decade ago or so. Um, certainly, you know, again, it's one of the first times I think somebody had really tried to apply how the techniques of MK Ultra were used to influence nations on the whole and not just individuals. Interesting. And the Chicago School of Economics was largely funded by Rockefellers, right? Isn't that part of the foundations, if I remember correctly? Is that correct? Do you know that? Um, well, the Chicago School, I mean, it really grew out of the, um, what was it, the Mont Pelerin Society, the MPS, uh, which had started in the uh, the late 1940s in the aftermath of the Second World War. And you really see pretty much all of the, the major conservative schools of economics there. I mean, in addition to the uh, Chicago School, there's also the Austrian School. But, um, yeah, I think the Rockefellers had supported almost all of that. Of course, um, David Rockefeller had graduated from the London School of Economics. Um, um, which is really where the MPS, you know, and that kind of whole ideology originated from. Um, he had worked with, what was his name, Frederick Hayek, or one of the big guys who went later involved with the MPS there. Uh, and it certainly seems like there was a, a lifelong interest in this particular, you know, policy. That policy was always supported. And he was also a Fabian socialist, too. Or I think he wrote his thesis on Fabian socialism. So he had some pretty interesting, uh, he has an interesting academic background. Um but so so Naomi Klein talks about the shock doctor, and you say that that one of the first applications of that was the uh, revolution against Allende in Chile by Pinochet. Can you talk more about that in detail? Well, sure. I mean, it was. Um, I mean, the thing that really stands out about you know what Pinochet did in Chile was just how bloodless, in a lot of ways, his dictatorship was, especially in comparison to some of the neighboring countries, of course, um, around roughly the same time, you had the dirty wars being fought uh, in Argentina, uh, and that, you know, resulted in quite a, a considerable amount of civilian casualties. I mean, I, you know, obviously, we'll probably never know the exact totals, but I think it was somewhere around 50,000 people all said and done. I mean, they had years where over 10,000 civilians were murdered by the death squads and that type of thing. Uh, by contrast, in Chile under Pinochet, uh, you know, I mean, he was in power for nearly 30 years or so, um, and there were only, I think, a little over 3,000 deaths or something like that attributed to his entire you know, regime. So, I mean, certainly you can see how in Argentina, I mean, more people were being killed in a single year than what you know Pinochet managed in several decades in power. But I think a lot of that just had to do with you know how scientific quote unquote trauma had been applied to uh chile as a whole um of course one of the big influences were the french with the whole concept of liga revolutionaire um they had developed a lot of these techniques in algeria and then later on a lot of the french officers uh specifically trained the chilean security forces and you know you see a lot of these techniques i mean a big one was of course the um the infamous helicopter rides uh in algeria you know they would have Duck the uh, suspected terrorists or whatever, they would be horrendously tortured for about 24 hours um, after that point in time.
time it was deemed that they no longer would have valuable information. So it was time then for them to um, to commit suicide, uh, which was usually managed by being flown out in a helicopter over the Mediterranean and thrown into the sea. Uh, the rationale being uh, that eventually their bodies would wash on shore and it would be a great effect on the populace to see, you know, the mangled bodies of these people. Uh, this was definitely a technique that uh, Pinochet was uh, rather fascinated by. Um, so you had a lot of that kind of stuff being carried out, these sort of just really big ritualistic uh, instances of trauma. Of course, there was the famous, you know, the football stadium uh, where they had put a lot of the descendants together at one point and they were just subjected to all this white noise and um, lighting so they couldn't sleep. People were randomly being taken out and executed. Um, it was just in a lot of ways it was – it was a very elaborate, almost, you know, mega ritual in a sense. Um, and it certainly, I think, had just a profound effect on the populace to the point that, you know, it just wasn't really necessary to use the really uh, just the brutal tactics that prevailed in uh, Argentina at the same time. The Chileans really seemed to have embraced the whole concept uh, lifted from the communists of the propaganda of the deed. You know, they realized that, I mean, one high profile, significant death that was sufficiently horrendous enough uh, could have the same effect on traumatizing the populace that hundreds of deaths could have, if not thousands. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, that was a much more effective means of a dictatorship, sadly. Um, you know, you kill enough people, eventually their loved ones are going to be sufficiently outraged to do something, whereas uh, Chile, you know, they're just, I don't think, you know, there was ever really enough of a threat to the populace to really, you know, forge a full-blown militant revolutionary outfit, but just enough to keep everybody in line yeah and it's actually pretty fascinating when you think that they there wasn't that many deaths but so much terror and psychological terror that took place in chile um and they had i mean can you talk you you talk a lot about colonia digna die can you talk about what that was and its its relevance to the uh, overthrow of the Allende regime well, it was set up um, during the early 60s, I think 61 or thereabouts, um, by you know a group of expat Germans. Um, naturally, uh, quite a few of them were uh, former Nazis, which kind of goes with the territory. Um, you know, essentially, they bought up several hundred acres of um, land in the southern part of Chile and set up a massive compound there. Um, it was designed in a lot of ways like a traditional. Bavarian village. Um, everybody wore traditional grab from that whole era in the 19th century. German was typically the language that was spoken there rather than Spanish. Um, the secondary language was English, bizarrely. Um, you know, and it was definitely a very much a cult like atmosphere on par with, you know, what you would kind of expect from the Unification Church or something like that. Um, the inhabitants were usually expected to work 12 to 14 hour days. They were rigorously separated by the sexes, any kind of intimate contact between men and women was greatly frowned upon and actively discouraged. Uh, they were required often to do weekly confessionals in front of the dorms that they were uh, assigned to, which you know frequently could be quite traumatic for the subjects involved. So, I mean, it was a very effective means of brainwashing that really drew upon, you know, time-honored traditions. And then, of course, there was a bit of a spin. You see, you know, elements of electroshock being used there. Um, um, as time went on, they really set up just a massive uh, elaborate network of underground tunnels and so forth under the compound um, with torture facilities. I mean, allegedly, they uh, they had the ability to hermetically seal people into chambers and just administer electroshock from a distance, all the while they were um, listening to the sounds of Wagner over the PA, uh, that type of thing. Uh, occasionally, they would even resort to using dogs to maul at the genitals of the uh, people kept here. Um, so anyway, the colony, you know, it was up and running by the early 60s uh, in the lead up to the overthrow of Allende. Uh, ironically, on September 11th, 1973, the colony was probably being used as a rallying point for some of the uh, kind of street fighting fascist groups there to get organized with. Uh, but it really came into its own, so to speak, after Pinochet came to power. And it really became a crucial hub for um, the DINA, which was uh, initially the major you know, kind of intelligence service that they had, uh, which was an especially brutal one. Um, the DNI had uh, 
agents that were working there frequently they would use it as a torture facility for descendants from um, the Pinochet regime uh, there was also allegations that they had some kind of chemical and biological warfare program that was being conducted there of course it was a major hub to store arms in there was all kinds of arms trafficking um, the DNA, DINA was later implicated in drug trafficking as well so you know it would hardly be surprising if there were mounds of cocaine uh, somewhere in the underground tunnels as well uh, it was that whole area after all, um, yeah, and then of course, eventually it became a hub for uh, Operation Condor, uh, which really, I suppose, gave it a truly international reach, so to speak. And can you talk about what Operation Condor was? Sure. Well, I mean, it was essentially a program that had been set up with the various intelligence services uh, in the southern cone of South America. And um, a reoccurring problem that they had had with the various, uh, you know, rebel groups in the area is that uh, if you have one operating in Argentina, if the security forces were after them, they would flee into Chile. And then there was essentially nothing that they could do. And the thinking under Operation Condor is that, well, now, you know, if they flee into Chile, well, the Chilean security forces will simply abduct them for us or we'll cross the border and kill them there or, you know, any type of thing like that. So it was basically to enhance cooperation so that there was no safe place for the rebel groups to go to throughout the southern cone. But um, it was so effective that they started becoming very uh, ambitious after a while, and that led to them, you know, going outside of South America altogether. Now suddenly they're starting to carry out um, assassinations in Europe, assassinations even in the United States and D.C. on Embassy Row. Right. So, um, you know, it definitely had quite an elaborate uh, reach after a while. Uh, and as far as the, you know, the colony went, I mean, it was a hub for all of this. Uh, they had an elaborate radio monitoring system that was set up there. And it seems like essentially it was being used um, effectively to coordinate the collaboration between these different intelligence services throughout the Southern Cone. Yeah. And so who was this character, um, Michael Townley and why uh, Michael Vernon Townley and how did he kind of ties that kind of outreach of Condor into the U.S., right? Yeah, well, I mean, he was, uh, he's long been suspected of being a CIA agent. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of dispute about that, but um, it seems pretty certain that in some capacity he was working with our intelligence community. Um, and then, of course, he also seems to have had some dealings, too, with, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, David Adley Phillips, um, certainly one of the more notorious CIA uh, men from this era. Adley Phillips is the guy who um, a lot of Kennedy assassination researchers suspect of being Maurice Bishop, the guy who had been kind of directing the the anti-Castro Cubans that have frequently been linked to the assassination. But um Phillips had retired from the CIA around this time, and he had set up a, a very interesting uh, body known as the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. And this was a private network that really uh, was heavily involved in destabilizing Chile and the lead up to uh, the coup in 73. And Townley seems to have had ties with Phillips with this whole kind of network um, that the Association of Former Intelligence Officers represented. And, um, you know, this kind of provided a lot of plausible deniability, probably for the U.S. to have a, a kind of guiding influence of what was going on in Chile at the time. Right. And, uh, yeah, so Townley himself uh, was involved as kind of the intermediary for the anti-Castro Cubans who killed Letelier in Embassy Row, right? Yes, yes, I do believe so. I mean, he had also gone to work for the DINA um, once he had relocated to Chile in the aftermath of uh, Pinochet's ascension. So, yeah, I do believe he was um, the point of contact. And, of course, he had also been the point of contact for the um, the Italian neo-fascists that had been used to carry out some assassinations in Italy as well. Right, and I think that there was an ex-Chile guy that uh, they tried to kill in Italy, isn't that right? Wasn't there one of them? Yeah, it was. Um, it was a general. Yes, it was. Um, they basically screwed up because they didn't use uh, a small enough caliber pistol. Basically, um, yeah. For assassins, you know, if you're going to shoot somebody in the head with a pistol, you always use like a 22 or something like that because um, there's not enough. The bullet's not big enough for there to be an exit wound, so the bullet just keeps ricocheting through the skull and it pierces the brain from multiple angles. You're you know totally screwed if that happens. Uh, instead, one of the Italian neo-fascists used some huge pistol and the bullet uh, went straight out of the guy's head and he was miraculously able to survive it um, yeah definitely a testament to how you uh, you don't carry out an assassination right but it just does show that these guys the post-war leading up to the 60s and 70s there these 
people are still in contact internationally. They're operating and, and moving through different nations, and uh, even Italy itself had its own kind of modern kind of fascist, uh, like an Operation Condor kind of, or some some influence on the government. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's um, you know the whole kind of notion of the strategy of tension, uh, which was a you know an ideology, a strategy, so to speak, that Italian neo-fascists had begun to develop in the mid '60s. But um, essentially, it called for rash actions of terrorism carried out by both the left and the right, which would give to give a public perception of the state itself being under under siege and being destabilized, and this would eventually lead to a call for a military dictator which, from the perspective of the fascists, was highly advantageous in no small part because they were also you know, deeply involved in infiltrating the security services. So theoretically, this would provide them with the window they needed to finally destroy the communists once and for all and assume control of the government. Um, you know, certainly Condor as well really became quite obsessed with assassinations and terrorism as time went on. But, you know, kind of the, the guiding thread behind all of this was um, ultimately the French connection, so to speak, that, uh, you know, that whole concept of Le Guerre Revolutionnaire that the French military officers had devised and deployed in Algeria. I mean, the strategy of tension was really just an adaptation of Le Guerre Revolutionnaire. Um, quite a few of these, uh, the Italian neo-fascists were very close to the OAS, the secret army organization, uh, the group of descended French military officers that had revolted against de Gaulle in 61 and effectively had fought a low-key civil war in France for about two years. So in the aftermath that they're soundly defeated, they had started to hook up with a lot of these Italian neo-fascists and some of the old Nazis in Spain and so forth and uh, essentially sought to take the struggle against communism to a, a global level. And at the same time, um, de Gaulle had dispatched a lot of the... Uh, officers that he did not entirely trust but who had not openly sided with the OAS to South America at the time to serve as military advisors and so forth. A lot of these guys were the same like revolutionary uh, theorists. So you know, almost all of this ideology was kind of being directed stealthily from this uh, this French doctrine of counterinsurgency. And ironically, I mean, this was also really the underlying influence behind the Phoenix program, which um, the United States was deploying in uh, Vietnam at the same time as well. Interesting. Interesting. And did the OAS try to get an assassin to kill the Gaulle? The Gaulle? <laughs> uh, they tried to. Uh, it was multiple times multiple that times they tried to kill the Gaulle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. I think they tried to kill de Gaulle, yeah, at least five or six times or something. But um, I don't know if they directly hired an because okay. most of the the OSS guy, the OAS guys were pretty much uh, the the officers, the military men that sided with the OAS were almost entirely either Psi War officers or special operators, special operations forces. So these were already really, really elite troops in the first place um you know very skilled assassins and that type of thing and uh yes they did try several elaborate attempts to assassinate de gaulle i think the most famous one was when they had tried to assault his limo when it was um driving down you know the middle of paris streets and multiple you know uh gunmen took shots at it and somehow he kind of miraculously survived yeah, it I remember those stories i think there was a movie maybe it's more fiction than fact but uh it was about the 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 group of oas you know, military guys getting together and trying to kill him, trying to shoot him, assassinate him. Yeah, um, De Gaulle. Yeah, yeah, he was something else. That was for sure. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he was uh, amazing. So, um, let's see. So, uh, there was all kinds of strange characters taking place in Italy, though. Like there was the Black Prince, uh, the post Salo Republic, which uh, the infamous film The Salo is uh, based on. But uh, who was Stefano Della Chai, and can you talk a little bit about him? Well, uh, Stefano was, um, I think he was referred to at times as the Black Bombardier. Um, he was probably the leading uh, Italian terrorist of this whole, you know, era. Um, I think it was probably signature piece was that uh, the bombing in 1980, uh, was it, shoot. I can't remember the name now, but it was the train uh, that they had blown up at the station, I believe. And it was, gosh, I think roughly like 100 people had died in it. There were several small, you know, young girls there who were 
you know, the blast, the heat from the blast was so hot that their bodies were just totally incinerated from it. Um, and this kind of capped, you know, almost a decade or so of high profile terror acts that had been carried out in Italy that uh, Stefano was a major figure behind. Uh, in Italy, these uh, this whole era is kind of referred to as uh, the years of lead, so to speak. But um, Stefano established, you know, very much an international network. Of course, he had relocated to Spain. Uh, while he was there, he had hooked up with Odo Scrissini, the uh, famous Nazi commando who had rescued Mussolini uh, with, a, what was it, hand gliders or something to yeah, that effect. Yeah, they glided uh, into the, where he was captured, yeah. Of course, Grazzini had also set up one of the earliest modern private military companies that was known as Paladon, uh, the Paladon Group. So uh, Stefano was kind of hooked up with this whole paramilitary network there. Uh, he also had dealings with uh, a Ginter Press, which was um, essentially an intelligence service that had been set up by these old OAS veterans uh, in Portugal with the assistance of the Portuguese security services. And then, of course, later he would relocate to South America. He would have dealings with the DINA in Chile. He would have dealings with the Argentinian death squads. And um, he would eventually end up with the, um, what were they uh, called, uh, the Fiancés of Death or something to that effect. <laughs> uh, effectively, a group of former Nazis who essentially took over uh, Bolivia, I think it was, in 1980 as part of what is referred to as the uh, the cocaine coup, because yes, it uh, basically set up Bolivia as a full-blown narco state there for a brief period of time until it became a little embarrassing to the United States to have an open former SS man effectively running the country. Yeah, was that Klaus Barbie? Yeah, he, yeah, yeah Klaus Barbie. Barbie. Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah, it's amazing that those guys, and it shows like these guys like Scorzini and Stefano Della Chai, they're operating at an international level Level because Scorzini was, I think according to your book, he was sending weapons all over the place. Wasn't he like shipping weapons all over? Yeah, well, that was another big thing that Scorzini had gotten involved with in the Cold War era was arms trafficking. And, um, you know, I mean, he had no morals whatsoever uh, in that regard. Um, you know, I mean, you kind of go back to the whole Suez crisis and Nazar and Egypt. I mean, on the one hand, he had been supplying uh, troops for Nazar's forces and training them. And then on the flip side of the coin, he was helping the British. Uh, and the same thing continued in Algeria. He essentially funded both sides or provided right. aid to both sides, the French and the Algerians. Um, in the case of, you know, the Suez crisis, I mean, it reached a point of absurdity where essentially Scorzini is openly recruiting former Nazis from Eastern Germany. Uh, you know, the communist bloc had advertisements in the newspapers and everything for this. Uh, yeah, yeah, all on behalf of the CIA. So, yes, the CIA right, but, is using... No, but Scorzini was, was tight with, I think, the rocket scientists that Egypt was... Uh, hiring, and then on the other side, he was selling them out to the Israelis. He was giving yeah, all the that's... information to Mossad. Yeah, so yeah and then on top of that, yeah, yeah. Then he started helping Mossad, I think, assassinate some of the uh, the yes. Nazis that he brought in to work with yes. Nazar. And exactly. Like I said, Scorzini was <sighs> completely unscrupulous. Uh... <laughs> unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Uh, but yeah, he was also involved in the Battle of the Bulge. So he was like one of those guys who was dressing up as American soldiers. I mean, he was yeah. all over the place. It was really crazy. Um, yeah, yeah. So you've got these guys. You've got Stella Stefano Della Chai. You've got Borghese, who Angleton saved, right? James Jesus Angleton was involved in Italy. I think he grew up in Italy, if I remember correctly. So he was there, right there against all these anti-communist communist operations. Um, well, I think in the case of Angleton, I'm not sh He might have grown up in... Um, I'm not sure, though, because I feel, feel like his mother was actually Mexican or something yes, like that. Yes, that's where he got the Jesus, but, um, but his dad was a businessman in Italy, and I think that he had either gotten some training... I think he ended up at Yale or Harvard, but I think he ended up at Yale. It was it was Yale, yeah. yeah. He was skull and bones. Um, yeah. But yes, no, he did end up... I mean, you're probably right, because he was um, deployed to Italy um, during the Second World War when he was with the OSS, because he was um, a fluent Italian speaker, if I remember correctly. He had spent some time in his childhood in northern Italy, I'm almost positive, because I read that book by um, Jefferson Morley. Uh, really good book. That uh, Yeah, I mean, he was... 
Of course, he was also a Knight of Malta to Freemason. Um, he handled the Israeli desk for years and uh, the CIA. So, I mean, he had pretty much all of his bases covered, fanatical right. Catholic, Zionist, uh, skull and bones. <laughs> yeah, no, amazing. He, his arc of his life was something. He was friends with Kim Philby and was just shattered when Philby turned out to be a communist turncoat. I mean, just all kinds of crazy stuff. Um you do talk about another Italian. You reference him as a Sith Lord. Who was Julius Evola? Evola was um, a cultist and a philosopher. Um, he had originally kind of rose, uh, rose into prominence in the 1920s, uh, shortly after Mussolini had come to power. He had initially been somewhat captivated by fascism, but um, after a time he felt that it didn't go far enough played too much the labor classes the trade unions and other rabble and such like um really a lot of his system was based off of the hindu caste system though in his cosmology uh it would be the warrior caste that would have been elevated to a status above the brahmins um yeah he was very much obsessed really with just the whole kind of concept of warrior monk philosophers of course there was a lot of reverence for the knights templar the knights hospitar uh all the kind of prominent medieval catholic military orders and that type of thing um he went to work for nazi intelligence services uh, as the war years were winding down and there's been a lot of speculation as to what exactly he was doing he himself largely claimed that he was working on a book on the history of secret societies as the war was coming to at a conclusion which is really quite bizarre this is at a time when you had soviet troops and allied forces overrunning greater germany it yeah, doesn't he, he really was in germany sense. right so he was in uh, he was in austria he was austria. in austria okay, but gotcha. uh, yeah but yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense that they would have actually put resources towards him, you know, researching this book at a time when the Reich was literally just being destroyed before their eyes. Um, you know, I think the great Kevin Coogan probably had the best ideal. He was being used essentially to create a new kind of pan-European ideology that could rally the former Nazi forces in the post-war years around, of course, up to this point. Nazism and their, you know, kind of a cult system had been very much oriented towards the Germanic European races. Evola tried to take this into more of a pan-European direction, and um, certainly it seems like it's proven to be very influential in the post-war years. Um, of course, a lot of this kind of was uh, disseminated through the Landig group in Austria, and, um, you know, Landig is where you get a lot of the, you know, the Black Sun and uh, the Lost Battalion and all of these you know, tropes that have become so instrumental in uh, post-war Nazi occultism. Gotcha. And I think he came to some people were came on the map because Bannon mentioned him, right? Steve Bannon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he's also had a big influence on, um, what's his name, uh, Dugan in Russia. Right. Of course, Putin's uh, alleged Rasputin. Um, he had a large influence in... Uh, What's his name? Um, gosh, Nick Griffin, maybe some of the uh, the you know members of the old British National Party, if I remember correctly. But um, you know his whole concept is uh, traditionalism. Oh, and yes, and then also the uh, the French theorists in that regard too. Gosh, I can't remember the main guy's name now off the top of my head. But um, I thought yeah. he was kind of a fan of the alt right too, like the modern, like the real, you know, kind of right wingers in America. I thought that they were fond of Ebola. I think that some of these guys are mentioning him. I can't remember their names. Probably only less than two or three percent of them even understand what he was talking okay, about. This book. So, um, yeah, Evola, it was pretty much his ideology was all, you know, intended for initiated elite. He thought the masses of humanity were completely and utterly useless and superfluous. Um, yeah, I mean, it was very much an ideology to indoctrinate an elite with, and, you know, that was really its ultimate purpose. So it's not surprising when you kind of see nowadays, you know, where his influence is. It's in these, you know, these major theorists, people like Dugan, like Bannon, and that type of thing. Right. Um, do you want to just, we're kind of coming to the end, we're at about 35 minutes. Do you want to touch a little bit on the uh, brief history of the private security racket? Oh, sure, sure. Well, you know, I mean, that was definitely an interesting topic um, when I was researching this. Um, of course, a lot of this really kind of came uh, into being in the 60s, um, where you started to see really a full-blown corporate structure merge with mercenary activities. And, you know, uh, there had been mercenary companies before, obviously, but they hadn't really existed uh, since the 19th century um, most of the mercenary activity, which, you know, he continued really throughout the 20th century, despite what you might hear, 
had mostly been on just, you know, a really informal basis, uh, you know, guy knows a guy type thing. Of course, the CIA has used mercenaries, I mean, pretty much from its inception. And um, the format for recruiting these guys was really through Soldier of Fortune magazine. You'd have discreet ads, you know, guys, kind of right. loose network of guys who knew each other. But um, things were a lot different in the UK. The British had been just completely humiliated. Uh, by Suez, and you had a lot of these imperialists who were desperate to try to keep some semblance of the empire going, and, you know, there was not an obvious way to do it necessarily, because, I mean, they didn't have the money, the United States was only willing to support them when, you know, what they were doing was beneficial to American interests, which, you know, was not always the case in the Middle East and Africa, and that was when a guy um, called Julian Amory had really hit on the notion of, you know, setting up uh, mercenary forces as a means to this, and, um, the way that this was first rolled out was in Yemen. Um, Yemen was where it was a place where the British had a major uh, naval base. It was really, you know, kind of a point of major access for them for the Mediterranean to secure oil and other raw materials that were essentially to their country. And then Azar had been sending forces in there to essentially overthrow the pro-British regimes in the country. And um, Amri, Amri had hit on the concept of using SAS men, special air services veterans, to go in there um, to basically turn the tide of power and to supply the rebel groups already there with weapons and so on and so forth. And the really novel innovation was that uh, in order to pay for all this, he got Saudi Arabia to do it. So now basically you had set up a whole off-the-books operation that had almost no ties to the British government, and it wasn't even being funded by the British government. You know, it's all third parties and all that type of thing. So now you suddenly have a convenient way to continue British imperial objectives without having the government even directly involved in it. And um, one of his accolades, Julian Amory's accolades, was David Sterling, who was um, Colonel David Sterling, who was one of the founders of the Special Air Services. This was the guy that Amory had gotten to organize all of this. <clears throat> and it was so successful that Sterling had decided to set up a private company called WatchGuard International. And this was really the first uh, modern private military company, and now it would continue with the same kind of stratagem. You know, you would have these former SAS men uh, and also arms that the companies could provide, and you would get a third party to provide them with funding, and now they could go out and they could carry on British imperial objectives in this fashion. And this just led to a massive proliferation of these companies going into the 70s. I mean, you had Control, Control Risk Limited, you had Keeney Meany. Uh, Sterling's later mercenary company, KS International. And then, of course, going into the 90s, you end up with um, the infamous executive outcomes. I mean, that was mainly comprised of South African veterans, but uh, the British were actually the major stockholders in it. Interesting. Um, yeah. And that, you know, really, I think, laid the blueprint for, you know, where we're going uh, in the new era, essentially. I mean, really, you know, they almost set up a series of mini East India companies in Africa in the 90s. Um, the big guy behind this was a guy named Tony Buckingham. He was a special boat servant veteran who had become one of the major stockholders and executive outcomes and he also owned an oil company he owned um, diamond consortiums all that good stuff and you know this guy would go around to <clears throat> a place like Angola where they had a lot of oil reserves there but um, you know the country's torn apart by civil war there's different rebel factions one rebel faction controls the oil the other one doesn't so he would locate who he thought there would be a good partner. He would go to them and ask them to sell him some of their oil rights so he could drill there. Well, we'd love to, but we can't do that because, you know, the, that part of the country is controlled by a rebel group. Oh, well, that's no problem. Tell you what, you know, I'll lend you the money and you can turn around and hire my mercenary firm. They'll go in there and clear out all the rebel groups there for you. And, you know, you'll just give me the rights to the oil in return, and, you know, I'll give you maybe 10% of the profits, and, uh, you know, we'll all get rich while the rest of your country continues to starve. Uh, and this was a process that the British really just pre repeated over and over again. And, I mean, it really goes on to this day through companies like Saracen and um, <clears throat> some of the, uh, what was it, Aegis, uh, which was uh, set up by Tim Spicer. So, um, you know, it was definitely a very new way, or I shouldn't say a new way, but I mean, for the modern era, it was a different way of doing things. And, of course, in the United States, uh, there were people that were aware of this, and that's where you start seeing in the United States, you know, once again, the rise of a lot of these private military companies in the 90s, right. starting with DynCor, and then, of course, going into Blackwater and, uh, you know, all the kind of usual suspects with that. 
Right. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. And so all these people can kind of wash themselves and their interests through these private military people, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, on top of that, I mean, you know, of course, previously mercenaries were very marginal figures. You know, I mean, these are just basically guys in a lot of senses living paycheck to paycheck, whereas now, you know, they're the CEOs of major Fortune 500 companies. I mean, they've got millions, if not billions of dollars of assets at their disposal. I mean, they can afford, you know, I mean, Black Hawk helicopters and all the implements you need to stage a coup or something like that. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, uh... Recluse, we are now at 40 minutes. Is there anything I missed, anything you'd like to add, anything that uh, we you'd like to share be, well, before we wrap this up? Sure. Well, um, I mean, one of the things, you know, that uh, is kind of occurred to me since the book dropped and the whole thing with the COVID-19 uh, stuff going on is just, um, you know, I think how relevant it is to go back and look at the uh, the anthrax attacks from 2011, which occurred really, I think, within a week or two of 9-11. Uh, and, um, you know, a major factor behind this was the um, the private intelligence firm SAIC, uh, which had been around since the 70s, but, I mean, it really got into the intelligence racket in the 90s. And um, SAIC had been pushing for a new Gulf War, a new war with Iraq since the late 90s. You had directors that were constantly making the circles on the cable news networks talking about Saddam's chemical and biological warfare programs and all that good stuff. And then, of course, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, you start having these anthrax attacks that come out and um after a while it turns out that uh one of the suspects the fbi appointed to for this was a man named stephen hatfield who had worked for saic and you know he had a very interesting career he had been a green beret he had spent a lot of his time in southern africa initially in rhodesia and then later in south africa both of which were countries with notorious um, cbd programs and which also were closely related to special forces so hatfield then relocates to the united states in 94 after apartheid ends in south africa and less than a decade later he's become a central figure in this anthrax scandal um all the while he's working with saic and then of course the anthrax attacks were later used as a major rationalization for the invasion of iraq i believe colin pell himself had even cited that in uh, the united nations speech um, of course, later it came out that, uh, you know, Iraq had nothing to do with it, nor did any other, you know, Islamic terror group. It was all done by one of Hatfield's associates uh, working at, a, you know, a federal government uh, CBD facility, essentially. So, you know, it does kind of beg the question. And I should point out the guy that they ultimately pinned this on uh, committed suicide before the trial even started. So there's there's certainly a lot of questions. Yeah, but he or not couldn't he... have done it either. I mean, that guy was just a patsy. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, yeah. The guy that... Do you know that yeah. Hatfield is still around? He's he's making comments on this COVID case. Oh, yeah, uh, the, yeah. He's on, like, Stephen Bannon. I mean, we talked about Bannon, but he's on Bannon's podcast. It's like yeah, global no. pandemic podcast. So they're, these two interesting characters are uh, still chums. Still chums. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you know, the whole thing is you basically have a Fox... Um, you know, I mean, anthrax attack on the United States, which is then used as a rationalization to ratchet up things with Iraq and eventually go into a full scale war for it, where we were expecting to find chemical biological weapons. And ironically, Hatfield had actually um, built and dump, uh, built dummies of the mobile labs uh, that the Delta Force and the Green Berets uh, trained on the lead up to the Iraq invasion, because that was what they were going to find when they got to Iraq. Right. Um, wow. So that's incredible. You know, and, I mean, it's really incredible now what you're seeing, you know, currently playing out now with all the, you know, the hostility to China and, uh, you know, the fact that Trump really seems to be, you know, reorienting the narrative towards uh, a chemical or biological attack by China and this whole thing. And, of course, it's kind of convenient that uh, the lockdown is already being used effectively to put the country on war footing and not, you know, war footing for a conflict with Iraq or some other, you know, mediocre third world country. But uh, I would say a first world country and one with a military that would actually pose a real challenge to us. Yeah, pretty scary stuff. I mean, if you look at Bannon's rhetoric, he's talking about some very serious rhetoric and laying the blame at China, you know, as a responsible party. So things oh, are yeah. pretty dicey, pretty uh, yeah. pretty dicey. But congratulations I mean, on the book, man. It's a great book. Tons of information, really dense, factual, uh, referenced information. So I highly recommend this book. Again, the title of the book is Strange Tales of the Parapolitical. Published, it's available on Amazon, correct? 
Yes, sir. Oh, that's cool. And again, your uh, blog is v i s u p v i e w viceupview.blogspot.com, and the name of your podcast with Frank Zero is the Farm, right? It's the, Correct. The Farm dot com. What's the website again? It's uh, www.thefarmpodcast.com. Thefarmpodcast.com. Gotcha. And again, it's Recluse. Title of the book, Strange Tales of the Parapolitical. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me on, William. All right, take care.